Well, hi there. Let's talk about pain. These are velvet ants, members of the family Mutilidae, also known as cow killers. Now, two of those names are misleading. These are not ants, they're wasps, and they probably can't kill a cow. It seems that this name comes from the fact that their sting is so excruciating that people think it could kill a cow. It could also be that you have the uncontrollable urge to exclaim, HOLY COW, THIS KILLS! But how badly would this actually hurt? Well, fortunately, I've never been stung by a velvet ant. That said, there exists a measure of pain from the stings of bees, wasps, and ants, the hymenopteran insects. This measure is called the Schmidt Sting Pain Index. This rates the intensity of pain from hymenopteran stings on a scale from 1 to 4, with 1 being the sting of some ants and small bees, where you can feel the venom, but it's almost more spicy than painful, and with relatively short duration, maybe 5 minutes. 2 would be more intense, like the sting of a honeybee or a yellow jacket. These stings last a bit longer, maybe 10 minutes, and definitely qualify as being legitimate pain, though not debilitating. At level 3, you have pain that will stop you in your tracks. I've been stung by a few level 3s. As a child, we had a nest of harvester ants in my backyard. They were fascinating, and I loved to watch them. But I knew that I was taking a real risk as I experienced their searing stings on more than one occasion. While I still like to watch them, I never stand stationary. That sting is no picnic. It isn't spicy, it's fire. More recently, I was stung right here in the reptile room by a paper wasp. I was doing a face-to-face -face tour over Zoom when I suddenly felt the most excruciating pain in my right kidney. It was clearly some sort of a sting or a bite. I punched the area a couple of times, but I couldn't immediately locate the culprit. Given the intensity of the pain, I wondered if I'd been bitten by a black widow? I even checked to make sure the Vietnamese giant centipede was still in its enclosure. And then I found it. Dead on the ground. A paper wasp. It was agony for maybe 10 minutes before the pain really began to subside. A week later, I still had a 2-inch diameter swelling on my back at the site of the sting. That was a 3. And this is where velvet ants fall as well, with pain said to last 30 minutes or more. In the world, there are a few fours as well. The tarantula hawk and the bullet ant generally score up here. So greater pain from hymenopteran stings does exist, but the velvet ant is very near the top. And if my experience with less notorious threes is any indicator of its intensity, you don't want to experience it. And it isn't hard to avoid. While males fly, they do not sting. And Females do not fly. The key to avoiding the sting is not to step on one with bare feet and don't pick them up. But they're so cool. Which is why I picked this one up and why I invited Russ from Aquarimax Pets, who has been keeping velvet ants for a very long time, because wouldn't it be an amazing pet? Well, to find out, we'll have to score the cow killer based on our five categories, which are Handleability, care, hardiness, availability, and upfront costs. When it comes to handleability, we give the velvet ant a score of 1 out of 5. The reality is, this is not a terrible animal to hold. Except for that sting. They are fast, but they can also hold on, and despite being small, they are not delicate. I have a few pinned in my insect collection from when I took entomology, their exoskeleton is the hardest of any insect I've ever seen. It was like driving a pin through a popcorn kernel. So I very much doubt that you would harm your velvet ant accidentally. And honestly, if you started to smash it accidentally, they have a way of letting you know that they would like for you to stop. And though I don't get the idea that they would use it on you if you weren't trapping or otherwise restraining them, I can tell you that I'm not tempted to pick mine up. That stinger, present only in females, is actually a modified egg-laying apparatus called an ovipositor. It's about the same length as their abdomen, and highly flexible. There really isn't a way to restrain a velvet ant with your fingers without being stung, and it's a doozy 
though technically not as dangerous even as a honeybee. And the sting is not their only defense. I already mentioned their ridiculously strong rounded exoskeletons. Also, you probably noticed their interesting colorations. This is a form of aposematic warning coloration. We actually have a really cool video about how this works. And what you will notice is that the different species of velvet ants and other dangerous insects in the same area have these same colorations. Dangerous animals that look like other dangerous animals, thus magnifying the efficacy of their aposematic signals, are called mullerian mimics. So velvet ants are protected by their colorations. But wait, there's more. They also make a noise by stridulating. They have plenty of ways of saying, you know, I wouldn't pick me up before they ever need to show you why that is the case. I'd like to pause for just a moment to say thank you to our patrons at Patreon. Sometimes when you're wandering around in the desert, you find something that is stinking rad, like this incredible mutilid. And of course, now because of Russ, I'm super excited about mutilids. I know what I'm going to be doing for the rest of the summer, which is looking for more mutilids. And I'm going to need a rad enclosure. And then it will be something we can show off here at the room. And thank you to our patrons at Patreon. That will all be possible. In fact, you guys allow us to do much, much more than this with this channel. You've allowed us to grow, improve our equipment, make changes to our backdrop, and so many other things. So... Uh, you know, if you'd like to support this channel and help us continue to move forward making content like this, please consider supporting us on Patreon. When it comes to care, we give the cow killer a score of 5 out of 5. And I'm going to turn over the time to Russ from Aquarimax Pets to talk a lot more about the care of these cute, terrifying little insects. As you have probably gathered from what Clint has already said, mutilids are not the invertebrate for everyone. However, if you have your heart set, on some pet velvet ants, here's some care information. Please note that only the wingless females, not the flying males, are generally kept. Velvet ants need some space to move around in, as well as additional surface area within that space. They'll make use of every inch of accessible space you can offer them. Provide things like rocks, choya cactus skeletons, and cork bark for them to crawl on, crawl in, and hide under. Because velvet ants are fairly good climbers, they can climb glass to some extent. A tight-fitting lid is a must. Mutilids have different environmental preferences in the wild. Some prefer very sandy areas, while others seek out hard-packed soil. The substrate I use for velvet ants is a base of play sand with the addition of cocoa fiber and some other organics such as crushed leaf litter, and that seems to work very well. Velvet ants will take full advantage of a basking light, but of course, they'll need a large enough enclosure to allow for a thermal gradient, so keep that in mind. In summer, during the day, I keep my hot spot at around 89 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, with the cool side about 9 to 10 degrees cooler. When the lamp goes off at night, temperature in the entire enclosure is in the 70s Fahrenheit. The room is a few degrees cooler in the winter, but the basking light still provides a thermal gradient, and they still do just fine. Like little wingless, featherless hummingbirds with exoskeletons, Mutilids are full of energy, and to maintain that energy, adult velvet ants feed largely on nectar. In a captive situation, they will feed on soft, juicy fruits, such as cut grapes, pears, etc., which can be replaced as they dry out. However, I offer two items around the clock. Beetle jelly, which I purchased from bugsinsyberspace.com, and a one-part sugar to six-part water solution with a minuscule amount of salt added, which I offer in this ant feeder. The beetle jelly dries out over time, so I spritz it with water frequently and replace it with fresh jelly every week or so. The combination of these two items seems to be very effective in keeping the velvet ants well-fed and hydrated, and their captive lifespans seem to be longer when they are offered. Velvet ants are solitary insects in the wild. As you can see here, however, they seem to do very well in a communal setup, even when several different species and sizes of velvet ants are involved. We've established that mutilids coexist peacefully with other mutilids, but as I learned from bugs in cyberspace several years ago, they also thrive alongside various species of desert tenebrionid beetles. This can make for a very active, diverse, and entertaining desert community, especially in the afternoon and evening hours. It's important to remember that while velvet ants are not particularly defensive, they are very well equipped to defend themselves. When I was about 10 years old, I was stung by a velvet ant because I was fascinated by its stridulation 
which is, was a warning to leave it alone. Needless to say, I did not leave it alone in time, and I still remember that experience vividly. The velvet ants I have kept as pets, however, have never even come close to stinging me because I've never given them a reason to do so. If you do decide to keep velvet ants, treat them with care and respect. Unfortunately, because velvet ants breed by entering the nests of ground nesting bees and wasps so that their larvae can parasitize the other wasps' larvae, captive breeding is currently far from practical. However, it wasn't that long ago that blue death feigning beetles were considered nearly impossible to breed successfully, and now we're breeding that species. And the more we learn about velvet ants, the closer we are to success. Thank you, Russ. If you don't already subscribe to Aquarimax Pets, get over there. What are you doing? When it comes to hardiness, we give the Slayer of Bovines a score of 4 out of 5. This is a pretty hardy little insect. They are actually very difficult to smash or kill accidentally. Many species are found in the desert and other inhospitable habitats, so they're tough. When you collect an adult velvet ant, you have no idea how old it is. They can live a couple of years, but don't be surprised if it doesn't live anywhere near that long. When it comes to availability, we give the Dairy Destroyer a score of 3 out of 5. Okay, I want to start by saying that you can buy these online or, depending on your location, collect them from the wild. Honestly, collecting your own is probably the best way to get these as the ones you will buy online are also field collected. And then they're being kept under unknown conditions and then shipped to you. And this is because these guys are extremely difficult to produce in captivity. For starters, most of them that you will see in captivity are female. Males do exist, but they're winged and therefore much more difficult to contain and care for properly. But this isn't the big problem. These guys are wasps, and like many other species of wasps, their larvae are parasitoids. Being a parasitoid is like being a parasite, but worse, because while parasites hurt the host, parasitoids eventually kill their hosts. In the case of velvet ants, they are parasitoids of ground nesting bees and wasps. They mosey into the nests of those other hymenopteran insects, lay an egg near their larva, and skedaddle. When the egg hatches, it makes its way over to the larva or pupa of the other hymenopteran and chows down. Everybody wins! Well, uh, except for the host, it loses everything and gets eaten alive. But the thing is that if you don't happen to keep and breed ground nesting bees or wasps, you aren't going to be able to breed velvet ants. So guess who breeds velvet ants? Nobody! That said, there are about 7,000 species, and there is a very good chance that one lives near you. And if you catch something that you suspect to be a velvet ant, you can verify that it is a wasp and not a true ant by looking at the antennae. Ants have antennae with an elbow called geniculate antennae. Wasps do not. So if you catch a wingless ant-looking creature with elbow-free antenna, there's a very good chance that you have captured a velvet ant, even if it isn't fuzzy, because some of them are not. When it comes to upfront costs, we give the six-legged false honey badger a score of five out of five. The wasp itself will be free if you find one yourself, but if you buy one, it will cost you something, but should be less than 20 or $30, even with shipping. You will need an enclosure, probably with a good lid, a basking lamp is a great idea, just be sure to keep it off to one side of the enclosure so that there's a cool side. Beetle jelly, crested gecko diet, sugar water, and other food should be available. Some sand, and you're done. And this is why, overall, we give the Gobbler of Baby Bees a score of 3.6 out of 5. If what you want is a cute nectar-eating little fluffer with a history of violence and one of the nastiest stings of all insects, then the velvet ant might be the perfect pet insect for you. As always, like and subscribe. Don't forget to check out Aquarimax Pets, and we hope to see you real soon. Males do exist, but they're winged and therefore much more difficult to contain. And therefore, much more difficult to can contain. Contain. <laughs> Handleability. Care. Let me try that again. That has been a. It's been a long time. Well, that wasn't a backwards hand. That was just my fingers getting overly excited. <laughs>